Nachdem ich mir jetzt angeschaut gehabt habe, diese, diese zweite Sache, wo die ein bisschen abrupt aufhört, ne? da war ich ja gerade dabei zu sprechen über das Buch Zero, wo ja die Fotos vom Studio und die Fotos von dem Musikfestival, der Black Woodstock ne? in Harlem, äh, vorkommen in dem Buch. Ähm, ich glaube, da habe ich begonnen zu erzählen, wie das zustande gekommen ist. Ich habe ja schon erzählt, wie das war, dass das, wo es gekauft worden ist, wie das weitergewandert ist und wie ist da eben der Madison Avenue und 8th Street. Mhm. Was ich nur sagen wollte, war, ähm, was mich auch fasziniert hat bei der ganzen Angelegenheit, dass das wirklich so eine Art, wie soll ich sagen, wirklich ein zeitgemäßes äh, Event ist. Ohne Internet wäre das nie passiert. Mhm. Der aus Australien hätte es, wahrscheinlich dieses Buch nie gefunden, weil ich glaube, er hat es über dem Computer gefunden, aber selbst wenn er in Tokio war und es dort gefunden hat, bis der, der hätte ihn nie gefunden, aber über das Internet konnte er mich finden. Ne? Und der ganze Prozess ist eine typische Internetgeschichte. Ne? Und wie, wenn du so willst, die Wertsteigerung dieses Buches, ne? ja. dass im Village unten, wo es 500 äh, Dollar ist verkauft worden, jetzt ist es da im äh, Upper East Side und äh, Sag ich, redest du Deutsch? Oder habe ich Englisch gesprochen? No, you speak German, but a very clear and understandable German. Oh! Maybe you also for <laughs> okay. international I should go audience. Back. I should go back into English. Did I, did I speak the whole time German? Yes, you spoke the whole you time. You didn't notice that? No, uh, it, uh, it's a proof that this is really a bilingual channel. <laughs> we, uh, anyway. Uh, we, we also can change to uh, French and well, not to uh, Japanese, but... Uh, no. Oh, well, I, I, sp I, speak, I speak more Japanese than French, I don't speak any French okay. at all. And, uh, but the Japanese I never call speaking, I call it broken speaking. <laughs> okay, back to English. But, but anyway, no, let me connect to the, the book. No, it's yeah. really fa it fascinated me that um, how the internet made this possible. Yeah. That the Australian guy finds it, puts it into the internet, an American company picks it up, puts it on sale for $500, they're selling it, and another company picks it up and has it now, I don't know if it still is there, but uh, is, is there for $1,000. So that's the history of that book. But that's kind of also, yeah, it's nice that it happened, no? I didn't earn a cent on the whole thing. Yeah, but that's, the, that's the question, because you didn't earn a cent on this thing. Uh, how did you make your living? What so, did you do to earn your money? Because okay, so I, Tokyo is an expensive uh, city. Right, and, right. Uh, okay, I, I made myself some notes, and I, I'm 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 going through it at random, so not step by step. But one thing is because people always people from the tax office uh, stop uh, looking now, you know, because now they are the anyway, secrets that's, of that's the, the financing. That's the past. That's the past. That's the past. So the tax people have no right to that okay, money. So. <laughs> and. Um, I start out maybe with this one thing because this is a very unique uh, situation, Japanese situation or Tokyo situation. I, made, I think I, made, I mentioned it in, in, the, in the first interview, in the second interview, but uh, no problem. I, I repeat it just briefly. And that was uh, teaching English through photography. Yes. That is one way I worked. I, I forget how many, did I work a year like that? Maybe something like that meeting people once or twice a week or something. And it was supported by Polaroid. They gave me cameras, they gave me film, and I used this technology to send people out and um, take pictures and then come back into the next week with these photographs, Polaroids, and use these Polaroids where they have this immediate or a very close relationship, mm -hmm. not something from the family album. Um, and they would talk about it. It helped them to open up, and it helped them to show something about their life. Mm -hmm. That was one, if you want to say, source of income. Not for 20 years, but anyway, it's one project. Basically, I'm telling you a project because um, I was not employed by a company for five years or 10 years or anything like that. Your, and, status, in, hmm? uh, your, your status in Tokyo and Japan was a tourist? Did you have um, initially, I went as tourist. No, initially, I went as tourist, but they had something very unique. 
which they called a cultural visa. Okay. So if you said you wanted to study pottery or you want to start study calligraphy or you want to study karate or whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. something from the Japanese culture, you needed, of course, some kind of letter from the people you studied with. Mm -hmm. And then you needed a letter, somebody okay. who, in case something happens, supports you financially. Because there's a very strict paper, which most Japanese are scared to sign, uh, because it says, in case I get sick, they have to pay the hospital. In case there's a problem, they have to pay for the plane ticket to leave, etc., etc. So more, and it's in very strict Jap Japanese. Most Japanese are scared to sign this, literally. So I had in the beginning, the people who wrote, was a Korean guy who wrote these supportive letters because a Canadian friend of mine who was sponsored by him said, listen, I have a good sponsor. So I met this guy, it's a Korean guy. Number one, he was Korean. He couldn't give a damn about what the Japanese thinking or doing. And he was not intimidated by that legal paper from the Japanese because he knew it means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so he supported me by signing these papers. And then I forgot, but I, I basically had always a, some, some, some friend or something who would support that. And it's just a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. What you do, see the Japanese take a different po position than the people here take. The Japanese take a position as strict as their laws are. Reality is, like if I'm an official and you are whatever, a tourist or whatever, if I don't have to know, I won't ask. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you ask me, yeah, but sir, can I do this and can I do that? The Japanese will go silent. It's like, it's almost, they don't say it, but it's almost, why the fuck are you telling me that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's funny, uh, immediately after the end of the Second World War, the U.S. Army had a special regulation for GIs here in Europe. Uh, GIs who wanted to study in Europe got a birth for one year. They could uh, choose wherever in Europe they wanted to stay to make for one year the studies paid by the government of the United States. And uh, it's rather interesting that a lot of American photographers took advantage of this. And mm -hmm. A lot of them stayed, especially in France, not only in Paris but also in southern France, and studied photography there. So uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, approach, I think, to culture. It's, it's a good uh, You see, one thing that's very interesting with photography in the United States, one reason why in the United States photography, generally speaking, has a very high standing is because you have to, um, if you look at the history of photography and if you look at the history of how America, how America grew, I mean, yeah, you can call it colonializing, but anyway, how it grew, it was with photography. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with that camera that is as big as a human being? Yep. Glass plate on a train. Specially designed camera for this. And this guy who, I forget his name, but uh, the guy who took the pictures, there was an incredible tree, boom, that tree. There's a landscape, that landscape. So through photography, as the trains advanced into the West, the whole thing was documented on this huge mm -hmm. camera. And just imagine what it means not only to photograph or to process, but to take these glass plates back east so that the government would know, ah, that's how it looks like over there. Mm -hmm. Because that's what, there was no Leica around. Eh? Yeah. So, um, number one. Number two, I mean, I'm going in big leaps, you know. Number two is, remember when there was the Depression? And the, was it Ron Stryker? Yeah, I think. He was like an art director or something. Mm -hmm. like that. And he gathered the best photographers, yeah. you know, Dorothy Lange, Walker Evans, etc., 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 and sent them out to the West to photograph so that people could see what's happening in the mm -hmm. country through the Depression. Mm -hmm. There's a famous case where you see the skull of, a, I don't know, an animal, I don't know which one to show 
how severe the situation is. There's no water, no food for the animals. And especially also the iconic for the, the migrant mother. Yeah, well, the thing is this, that um, this particular picture, there was the discussion that his head was not lying there, it was <laughs> placed there. It happens all the time. The same thing with the Robert Kapashat. Well, the Catalan people say to Smash, this is post. Everybody else says, no, this is real. Of course, the, the brother of Robert Kappa was said, no, this is real. Because it's almost as if the existence of Robert Kappa depends on this one photograph, you know, or the reputation of him. Because people who know the environment where the shot was taken said, there was no fighting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's the way even the so-called social conscious photography also was used in an advertising mentality way. But um, so America has this very strong that like the country grew with the photography and photography grew with them. Mm -hmm. That's how um, you take the guy Moholy Notch when he made um, the new school in Chicago and then he wrote that book um, Vision in Motion. Mm -hmm. There was no such book here. Mm -hmm. It was in English. I bought it recently in German here. Mm -hmm. It was published mid 2014 or something. Beautiful book in, in German translated huh? and I knew I knew that book in uh, English through a, a Japanese photographer Shimoto-san uh, who studied in Chicago and he had that book and he showed that to me when I talked to him in Tokyo. So we are Tokyo. Back in Tokyo and how you made your So here we're in Tokyo, okay, so we have this English photography we can say, okay, I go at random, okay. Mm. I developed in the mid 80s, I developed the concept that I called post-photographic pre-electronic. I used um, I used a Polaroid film. If you remember, there was a 35 millimeter mm -hmm. Polaroid film, color and black and white. Yeah. I used the black and white. I, I used the color film and made prints of it. Mm -hmm. When you made a print of this film, lines would appear. The films were designed for projection only for business meeting. To quickly photograph some, you know, draw, you know, business drawings or something like that. Artists would start right away scratching, peeling, all kinds of stuff. I made a print and said, "My God, this looks like as if I would have reproduced the color TV." Uh -huh. The same kind. That's where I got the idea of electronic image. I'm using a photographic technique. I'm using a photographic film, still Polaroid mm -hmm. film, but the image I get was like an electronic image. So I, step one, I, did, I had this idea to call this, this project I'm working on, post-photographic pre-electronic. First Polaroid supported me with this mm -hmm. because it fit into their business development. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember at that time, this is, this is mid eighties, you didn't talk yet about digital. You still talked about electronic. Even so it was slowly moving over, of course, into digital. Mm -hmm. The printing was digital printing. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I had um, some very abstract photographs, which I took initially, the first set I took in Manila and from palm trees. And I used certain filters to break up the image and then also used color filters to, as the wind blows and as the, the light filters through these leaves in movement, mm -hmm. um, the color and the images kind of mix, get mixed through the lens onto the film. So the 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 the, the polar people liked the whole thing very much, and the first first of all they supported me with film. The next thing they actually we made a lecture under that title. And uh, in a very famous design building, they had a gallery floor by Bridgestone, the, the tire people. And um, I made a, a lecture explaining to what uh, to the people what I just explained to you, making a, a, a slideshow, having a translator who simultaneously translated into into Japanese, mm -hmm. and it was very successful. People were very happy with this. Paul was happy. The people were happy with that. The director of that floor, he was actually the director of the design department, but he also was a director of the galleries. He says, what do you want to do next? And I had already shown 
two exhibitions on this floor in smaller galleries. And I said, I want to make this post-photographic pre-electronic in the main gallery. I want. Mm -hmm. And I told him um, the concept. So then I, we, he agreed, okay, we do it. We decided when, etc. And now I wanted to make the printing beyond photography. I did not want to use silver chrome, which I had done up to that date. I wanted another printing technique. A graphic artist friend of mine said, look, my, my parents have a printing press. They're doing something digital. Let's try. So I gave him some pictures. They made the prints. It looked different because also the dots were different. Something was different. Mm -hmm. But the paper was not, you know, the, the character of the paper was cheap. So I took these test prints and showed it to the director of the gallery and of this design floor. And I said, do you think this is good enough for the exhibition I want to make? Just a moment. Makes a phone call. He called Fuji. They had a printing press, a digital one. They said, okay. You know, because he was director in a very famous company, they didn't say it costs blah, blah. We make a test, you know. So these lab people, and you have to remember, this is a time they had, a, they made a drum scan. And on, you know, the, 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 the tapes at the time still, yeah. two and a half picture fit on one row. <laughs> And then they, it was, compared to today, it was very, really very, very, very cumbersome. No? Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, what they did was, I don't know, a week or 10 days later, we got like a sheet like this, one image and variations. It looked like beautiful silk screen. Mm -hmm. The paper had this matte surface. That, the way the ink was on. And here was the, the design director. I was in there. There, his beautiful translator woman, Japanese woman, who was, so we were like a little team, you know. We just look at each other. We said, textile. We could see this really translated into textile. So um, I made an exhibition there. And we simulated a textile exp because at that time there was no printing on textile yet. It was very near. Mm -hmm. It was 86, it was. And um, so I called Polaroid. I said, look, I have from Fuji this kind of result. Can I still, can we still work together? Can we? He says, no, Hans, we are working on a machine like this, but we're not ready. Go with Fuji. So I went with Fuji and from that day on, all the photography for this abstract stuff, I didn't do anymore with um, Polaroid, I did with Fuji. So Fuji gave me the film, Fuji gave me money to process, mm -hmm. Fuji gave me... So I made money on by doing this art project. That's the post-photographic pre-electronic. It carries all the way over then to here. It's another story. Then um, my diary is a very visual diary. Mm -hmm. And again, I had... Um, a friend of mine, a car designer, who loved this. He says, look, we have a very big printer from Canon. Let me test it, let me print it. We made prints, but it was only like a 60, 60 centimeters only, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. when they show the whole car, it would be in stripes like that. Mm -hmm. the, but the, the car would be still drawn. Mm -hmm. My hand made them. Look. <laughs> and um, so he was happy. <clears throat> so I was hoping that they would sponsor my exhibition of... But the director of the design company in Canon, he could see no value in letting this car designer using the Canon printer, because he only was thinking he has to write down how many meters of paper were used for what. Anyway, he said no. I go to a party, there's a guy standing there, he was a frame maker and he had made frame for my exhibitions before. Mm -hmm. I told him the story I just told him. I said, wait, I know some people. And he introduced me to Fuji Xerox. Mm -hmm. And this is a, for today, this is like, like having an ancient machine, you know. It was electrostatic printing. 
there was a head and the impulses would go through this and so the the image was maybe if you look carefully a little irregular but the colors were fantastic mm -hmm. and um, so I made an exhibition with my di one year cycle of my diary which is visual you know, there's paper like this and I'm writing not this way that way I, I wrote like this and very <coughs> irregular you still publish from time to time shots from the diary on Instagram? No, I, ha I, have, to, I have the diary. The gallery shots, this, I think all the documentation got lost, you know, but... Um, but you're still using, you're but still using this method today. This is another, you know, I started it in 91. Next year, which is, a two, you know, no, now 2023, that means it's like more than 30 years. I'm so doing today, that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's another book, that's another story. Okay. So <laughs> I wouldn't want to fit it in now. But the key point was, I made this exhibition with this Fuji Xerox prints and were hanging it. Mm -hmm. Like one month, two months, it was like this. No? Huge prints, 90 centimeters to, I forgot how that. One of the people who came to my show was a woman who was the wife of a fashion designer. Japanese and she says I want my husband to see this so I took this showed this to him he says I want this <laughs> it worked out fantastically you know it was 90 centimeters and then this way it was about 60 he reproduced that we made another print so he could give it to the reproduction company and made a shirt out of it mm -hmm. and the way a shirt is designed is out of four pieces 60 by 90 the back the front and each sleeve and that this was 92 I showed it to him and he my that shirt was um, presented at the Paris fashion show spring summer the following year a little business there I still have the shirts <laughs> so that was there then these these photographs I'm still with these photographs from uh, post photographic and pre-electronic Asahi Glass, which is the biggest glass company in industrial glass company in Japan, making high-rise building covers, not only in Japan but around the world. Mm -hmm. They had the idea, this was beginning of the 90s, they had the idea of making kind of a mirror boutique mm -hmm. in order to enter the design world and, into, and enter the consumer environment. So from my photographs, um, there were fewer five people. So one, I was one of them. All the other ones were Japanese. Um, these photographs were used to create mirrors. What that means, you have glass mm -hmm. with ceramic ink mm -hmm. on, from, and screen printing. They put my image onto that glass. Mm -hmm. Then they put the glass coating. And you look at it this way. You could see yourself in an image because it was, you know, where there was no photographic element, there was mm -hmm. the mirror coming through. And the idea was not the typical mirror where you go and comb your hair or shave, mm -hmm. but it was the mirrors as space dividers and for like a... a Decorative uh, all kind of yeah. All kind of interior design mm -hmm. applications. That was very good money. That was really... I said, if I, if I have such a job three times a year, that's mm -hmm. all you need. Literally, it was that well paid still. It's, it's a kind of, you know, what I got paid, I could pay the rent and basic food for one year. If the, the second job, I could start moving. And I said, third job, I can start flying. You know? <laughs> but it's, when you're freelance, it doesn't happen like that. Yeah. If you're a design office, maybe. But <clears throat> another thing, very different, but still the connection to Bridgestone was crucial. Um, Bridgestone introduced a robot which had a hand that simulated really the human hand because the muscles were substituted by thin rubber tubes. Mm -hmm. And air in, air out would make that move. And that way it could be very sensitive. Also the arm, they could all mm -hmm. do it it could do sensitive actions. Mm -hmm. So I said, wait a second. And I think the, the, the hand was not a complete hand, yet it was like this. 
but the arm was there. A friend of mine, and you might know his name, is an Australian fellow, Stellak. Have you ever heard his name? Stellak is a, was it's a, it's a huge story by itself, but fact is he had developed a five-finger arm. He's not an engineer, he's an artist, he had division. He got medical people, he got technical people to create this hand. Why he needed medical people, he would connect various muscles mm -hmm. to that hand. And as he twisted, he had to train himself. Oh, as he twist, uh, twisted or, or you know, made the con contraction of the muscles, the hand would move. Mm -hmm. So he would first make performance. There was plexiglass, was the arm, and there was the hand. He would put a pencil or a magic marker and he would write one word with three hands mm -hmm. just to show the body coordination and everything. So that hand was so good that even in the United States, the NASA people or something invited him to speak about that because they did not have that hand. They mm -hmm. had that arm which they used on the space shuttle and everything, mm -hmm. but not that hand. So also Bridgestone did not have this hand. So I connected Stellak to Bridgestone. I got paid through the coordination mm -hmm. thing. I got a coordination fee. Then that job was finished because a new that director and he introduced me to the other director. They said, Hans, why don't you make a, a, a study how we could sell this um, arm in the design world? So for about a year or two, I forget, I got paid every month a kind of a consultancy fee. Mm -hmm. And I used my artistic, if you want to say, networks, I'm designer, this and this and this. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand, this is a very Japanese situation. I cannot imagine this in Vienna. If you're not connected with a certain technical school or, or university, anything, you can't even talk to people. Mm -hmm. Here I was talking just as a creative guy mm -hmm. to people who appreciated my work. That's it. That's this. That post photographic, pre electronic. What I did in Japan still, I started printing, but not, it was not, the printing was not so good yet. On polyester we could print. Mm -hmm. But I started knitting mm -hmm. and I started weaving because there were computers designed for that. Mm -hmm. The same computer, there were three companies the national TV people who needed high definition, the knitting company who had the, the, the knitting machines, they needed it, and the second largest printing company needed for digital. So these three people got together and made one huge computer. It was a computer like the CPU was like this. Mm -hmm. what, what you have now like this, it's like this. Yeah. And so I, I was introduced through a network to knitters and to weavers and we made some, so with, this pro with these samples, I came to Vienna and I went to Backhausen. I said, what is this? I said, it's my photographs. We want to do this. So they were weaving, Backhausen was weaving and were planning to put it into a collection, but the company was slowly going down. So for a while they had it, but they did not support it anymore the way I thought they could. But the, at least one thing I knew, they said, in the whole world, there's nothing like this. Because they know the textile business, interior textile, and of course they're making some research going to the computer. So Mr. Flash, we wanna do this. There's nothing like this in the world. And I tell you, not, not being arrogant or being proud of it, to this day, there's nothing like it. That's why we'll introduce it again, maybe, through the book or through whatever. And I made an exhibition here and the way life goes, I made an exhibition here, and I fr it was in a photo space. My friend made a cover shot. Mm -hmm. I sent that cover shot to Japan, mm -hmm. a video director. One or two weeks later, says, Hans, we have a job. This was, and I was already gone from Japan in 95. In 96, I went back just for that. Rico, whom you might know for cameras, mm -hmm. you might know for uh, facts. In that year, 96, they introduced a digital camera. They introduced a tablet, which could communicate. Now it's standard, but at that time that was very advanced. 
And for the first time, they made a color copy machine. So these three products were used to simulate my project. And I was in that video movie showing, I'm taking pictures, I'm talking to us, the Indonesian Balinese woman, look, we're sending this to Vienna. Then the copy machine is in Vienna and we're making copies and we go to donate and we, we, we fake, fake, you know, the, how to make the design for the donate cover and everything. So the, the whole thing was filmed. I mean, the story goes from Bali to Vienna to Tokyo. Filming was from Vienna to Bali to Tokyo. And then in, at the business show, the Rico business stand was you, my work was used to introduce these products. Mm -hmm. That was good pay. Again, if um, three times a year such a job. <laughs> Uh, okay. Another thing where I used my photography a lot, like where I showed a lot of different architecture, you know, in Japan, in India, wherever I traveled. A friend of mine was an architect teaching architecture at a smaller school. But he invited me to hold slideshow talks. I got paid for that. I forgot how many months we did that, but it was nice money. Mm -hmm. The shirt I told you. That's that. We're finished here. I forgot, and I remember, I was teaching photo workshops. So for about six or seven years, or so, I was teaching photography in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was the only photo workshop in English. There was nobody else there. Now I think there's several people, I don't know. But at that time, I was the only one who was teaching in English. So I was advertising through a couple of English language medium. And it was going very well. It was very interesting to teach this photography. And I had private, I was teaching groups, mm -hmm. maximum 13, 14 people, minimum to make it worthwhile was like five, six people. And I was teaching also privately. One of my students is living in, is an American living in Hong Kong. I'm in contact now with him with my books and everything. And he's, so they're really, there's one American guy lives now in uh, New York. He originally is from Philadelphia, but I met him in Tokyo. We are still in contact. But we met through the photo workshop. You know. And the other thing, which was an interesting workshop, which was more amateur than the other one, uh, was Amer there is a very big club. It's called American Club. And it's what, number one or number two of private clubs. Businessmen and presidents, this president, and diplomats and everything. And the photo workshop was for women only. While the men were in the office, the women had all, had, if they didn't have children, they had nothing to do there other than, you know, they were so rich, they had a cook or something. They maybe went shopping once a week, I don't know, but they, they needed activities. So the American Club provided them with activities, ikebana, photography, calligraphy, whatnot. It was very interesting. All kinds of different, from different countries, women, how they related to Tokyo, their life in Tokyo, because they were really just coming there because of their husbands. Mm -hmm. So they needed something to do and how they relate to that situation in Tokyo. And a lot of people initially are overwhelmed by the size of the city and then living in a rich ghetto kind of thing. If not physically, then mentally they're in a rich ghetto. Club this, restaurant that, party that, but they're not in the regular life. Through the photography, they connected to everyday life. So it was, it was good money. Uh, one thing that's completely, that's one thing is completely, I did it for a short time. I was translating from English to German, technical stuff with a technical dictionary. I did this not very long. Eventually you really had to be a technician. Just a dictionary didn't do it. I was translating a factory and I was doing fine. And I came to the word valve, ventil, huh? valve. And then I, I did not know what valve. In German, in English, you can say valve. In German, you have all kinds of words for what kind of valve: hydraulic, mechanic, you know, digital, electronic. And I keep on reading back and forth, trying to figure out this factory, and I couldn't decide 
What kind of valve this could be? I just left it ventil, the German word for valve, and I figured the engineers who see this translation, they know. <laughs> they must know. But I had to, I kind of give, I gave, gave up on one word, the whole thing was bowing. But, but uh, the other... Uh, you see, we have already 30 minutes. We have 30 minutes. Okay, I'll give you one more and then we stop maybe. Okay. Last shot. La last shot is, I worked for Canon briefly. Oh. They needed, they were happy to have a photographer and I also was teaching photography to proofread the manuals okay. of how to use mm. a camera. And because the people who were the translators, American English, they had no idea about photography. So I helped that. And, um, but I did this for a couple, three months and then got, got paid well. Did that photo workshop also, but then it was finished because there was a, a limit as to how much, you know, they wanted me to be free to, and then suddenly they couldn't handle my free movement. They still wanted somebody who sits at the desk and doesn't talk to anybody, but I was moving on. They said, yeah, you can go out, you can talk to this, but I did what they told me I can do, and then they got nervous when they saw me moving. So, but I learned a little bit of how that business culture, and I got paid, okay? And that's that's the only job I did for Canon. That's it, right now here. I think <coughs> it was a very interesting installment of uh, this series of talks because it showed uh, that it was possible, uh, it, that it was not easy, but it uh, was possible to make a living from photography in a very broad sense. If you are not narrow-minded, if you are not focused on just one field, you could do a lot of different yeah. jobs and I think uh, that's the most important thing uh, for, for a good photographer, that he is not just looking uh, through, through the optic of his camera, but that has a broader outlook of the world. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it was very encouraging, and uh, maybe uh, people who saw this today uh, will reflect a little bit um, about uh, the times that have changed since then, because I'm not sure if all this would be possible Today, I think the same way it's not possible because uh, there are so. Uh, so many skills which are necessary, which are not uh, not, not forcibly uh, to be found in one person today. I think there's too much diversification today. But you know what I told people who I was teaching photography. I was telling some people I said, look, even if you don't become a full-time photographer, the way of seeing can help you in any other business. This if you're a teacher, if you're a mother, if you're a father, if you use that experience of developing your seeing, then um, you can apply it in business, you can apply it in many ways. This is such a wise word for closing this video. I thank you very much. This time I even will not tell that the worst photo is the one you don't take. Yeah? Uh, it's not necessary after this philosophical uh, phrase by Hans Fleischner. And uh, I hope we will meet soon again and I hope you will uh, keep watching. Much fun with this video and with those uh, that will follow. More, more is coming your way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.